so hi everybody my name is Rachel Cates and I am uh, here to present uh, just a snippet of the work that our team has been doing over the last year or so on ethical R&D in pandemic scenarios. Namely, uh, so today I want to talk about trust. Trust has come to carry a lot of weight over the last year and change. It's been discussed in academic literature, health organization briefings, and media coverage of the pandemic. In short, much has been written about trust and public health measures during emergencies. However, less has been written about the importance of trust in research and development. For example, with respect to the development of therapeutics and vaccines, and questions remain about how R&D can be made trustworthy during a pandemic. Many of these questions can be answered, at least in part, by examining responses to previous epidemics. So this presentation splits pretty neatly into four segments. First, we're going to talk about a brief introduction kind of to the meaning of trust, especially in the context of uh, health and public and global health ethics. It's important to pinpoint exactly what we mean when we talk about trust, uh, especially because in the second part of this talk, I'm going to demonstrate the need for trust in the R&D process. Following this, I want to spend some time evaluating and discussing trust in the context of the West African Ebola outbreak of 2014. Uh, and I'm going to highlight some of the major successes and failures of efforts or lack thereof to engage with communities and develop and maintain trust. And then finally, we're going to highlight a couple of lessons that can be applied from the 2014 to 2016 Ebola epidemic and argue their importance in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is actually part of a much broader project we're working on, one that considers the various elements that led to successes or failures in ethical R&D during the West African Ebola outbreak from 2014 to 2016 and looking at how some of those um, lessons can inform our COVID response and prepare for subsequent epidemics or pandemics. So in our initial review of the literature, trust was one of the essential components of effective response to disease outbreaks. The WHO situation reports on the Ebola epidemic also make frequent mention of trust as a factor in the success of certain public health interventions. So this presentation specifically focuses on trust because without trust as a building block, any efforts to collaborate or engage with communities and ensure that appropriate measures are taken to respond to a health-related crisis will be ineffective. Plus, trust is mentioned repeatedly in the WHO's COVID uh, R&D blueprint. It's a key focus for the strengthening of international efforts to curb the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's important to pull experiences from past outbreaks to inform appropriate response to this one. So there are a few elements of trust that I want to highlight here first. Obviously, we could spend all day discussing the intricacies of various philosophical writings on trust, but I think in this context, understanding that trust is relational is really key. So two or more parties enter into a specific kind of relationship. One philosopher, Annette C. Baer, defines as being one's acceptance of vulnerability that could allow for the other party or parties to inflict harm but that one judges the parties in question will not inflict that harm. While this can refer to how individuals interact with one another, in the context of public health and public health ethics, this can refer to an individual's expectation that their doctor, local hospital, or national slash regional healthcare system will care for them if they require medical attention. Of course, this isn't always or even often the case. Often when we talk about trust, we're referring to individuals relationships with other specific individuals. For instance, parents trusting a 15 year old to babysit their children. Here though, I'm mainly interested in two other kinds of trust. That placed in institutions such as hospitals and that placed in larger systems such as the healthcare system at large. An individual's experience can shape the eagerness with which they initiate trust in an institution or in their healthcare system. Every time someone has an experience with their healthcare provider or system that reinforces that initiating the judgment to trust was a good decision, they can grow more confident in the other party having their interests at heart and place that trust with fewer reservations or feeling like uh, they are made vulnerable by that situation. Conversely though, if those encounters demonstrate that, in, that an individual was mistaken in initiating the decision to trust their healthcare provider or system, trust can diminish over time. This disintegration of trust goes hand in hand with vulnerability. If you feel unsafe or uncared for by your healthcare team or the system at large, you'll be made to feel vulnerable, as Bear puts it. 
Ideally, we all live in societies where we are confident in making ourselves slightly vulnerable by freely placing trust in our leaders and healthcare systems. Ideally, we have this culture of trust that's kind of baked into the network of all the different trust-based relationships that we all participate in. But this isn't possible in many instances or places. So how do we encourage the development of trust in the context of R&D, especially during large-scale disease outbreaks such as epidemics or pandemics? The 2014 to 2016 Ebola epidemic in West Africa provides valuable and sobering insights into what makes trust work in the context of R&D. Initially, all three countries that bore the brunt of the epidemic, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, all showed the issues that can arise when trust is missing from the introduction of new public health measures. For instance, despite being told to call burial teams to safely bury those who died from Ebola, it was reported that communities in both Sierra Leone and Liberia were often met with no response, leaving them with no option but to perform the burials themselves. An experience like this would likely erode an individual or community's ability to trust their healthcare system as a whole. And when you add the colonial legacy of much of public health interventions in many lower and middle income countries, you kind of have a situation that's ripe for not just a lack of trust, but active distrust. For instance, in each of the three countries affected by the Ebola epidemic, R&D was largely run through national institutions with direct ties to former colonial powers. So France intervened in Guinea, the UK, and Sierra Leone, and American organizations were first on the ground in Liberia. We can also look back now and see how the development of trust helped curb the epidemic. Liberia was the swiftest to respond to and contain the epidemic and much of the success was attributed to the relatively high level of trust between affected communities and the government and other response agencies. Conversely, Guineans displayed low trust for a longer period of time, and there were multiple attempts to damage or harm aid workers, including uh, I believe one instance where a team of uh, journalists and aid workers were attacked and I believe some were killed. And so these kind of aid initiatives are also important to consider during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially as wealthy countries focus on vaccinating their own populations before turning to aid lower income countries by sending vaccines uh, and other supplies. But only once they've finished vaccinating their own populations. So what did work in terms of effectively intervening and building trust in communities hard hit by the Ebola epidemic? One particularly effective solution was community engagement. Community engagement demands that community members are consulted and involved in the development or research or interventions, from initial planning stages to feedback on research outcomes in order to respect cultural sensitivities. Dialogue of this nature ensures the concerns and perspectives of affected communities were accounted for in developing and implementing emergency response strategies. It was particularly effective to include local community leaders in the dissemination of control measures. And while those leaders ranged from older um, community representatives to vocal youths, depending on the country in question, community engagement was a tremendously powerful tool applied during the epidemic. These leaders could encourage their communities to trust both local initiatives and R&D initiatives of concern to international parties on the ground in West Africa. So I'll give a few examples. Following a series of violent opposition uh, events in Guinea, the WHO facilitated a community mediation process that led to the re reconciliation and enabled community mobilization and empowerment for Ebola response. In Liberia, community liaisons uh, were nominated by community members uh, and then chosen to lead the Ebola task forces in order to legitimize Ebola response strategies in that community specifically. While that may not have worked in another area, it was highly effective in Liberia. Openness, reflexivity, and accountability have been highlighted as crucial elements to successful community engagement for emergency response during the West African Ebola epidemic. But conversely, one of the shortcomings that was associated with the pandemic with respect to trust was the storage and use of data collected from Ebola patients. The epidemic created an avenue for data exploitation and hoarding given the rampant exportation of biological samples and data from West Africa to Europe and North America. And to this day, uh, much of these samples remain largely inaccessible to researchers and governments uh, in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. 
which means that the people who were so heavily affected by the virus have um, yet to really be able to work with data samples from their own countries. No, my slide's not changing. Yes, perfect. Okay, sorry. Finally, we turn to today. In the 2020 R&D blueprint for COVID-19, the WHO cites trust as a vital ethical inspiration, something to strive for in all R&D interventions. So we propose that there are three main areas where trust might be encouraged and maintained. The first of these is of course, community engagement. It was a marked success during the Ebola epidemic and it contributes to a practice where local expertise and customs are respected. Here in Toronto, as I'm sure is the case uh, all over countries where vaccination is underway, we've had lots of back and forth about vaccine hesitancy, especially in communities with a higher population of racialized people, which in Toronto has corresponded with a much higher rate of um, COVID-19 infection. Um, but is it really a case of vaccine hesitancy or is it the vaccination efforts have not connected with those communities to ensure that people in those neighborhoods are able to access the vaccine in a convenient location? In many cases, it's the latter. And by holding more pop-ups and making doses available in a wider number of places and engaging with neighborhood outreach groups, trust can be further developed. And since introducing more pop-ups in these neighborhoods, um, Toronto has seen vaccination rates in those areas skyrocket which is great and it's all based on further development of trust. The second lesson that we should take for the COVID-19 response is that international healthcare workers deployed to lower income countries in particular must be transparent about their roles. While this won't undo or make up for the colonial legacy that persists in these interventions where healthcare personnel in the global north are deployed to countries in the global south, this can allow for trust to be built within these parties in a way that wasn't present before. Finally, researchers working on COVID-19, especially in lower income countries, must collect data responsibly and with the understanding that prior experience may have contributed to communities not trusting that researchers from other countries will store and share that data responsibly and fairly. The pandemic in a way represents a new opportunity for researchers to make their data available or more readily shareable with colleagues in those lower income countries and honestly, it could prevent, pre present uh, opportunities for future collaborations and um, better, more trusting relationships between researchers all over the world. So to wrap up, um, ultimately, there are a number of takeaways for researchers to understand about the status of trust during the Ebola epidemic, and that these lessons can be applied to the COVID-19 response and R&D around the world. As the gap grows between countries with the resources to quickly vaccinate their populations and where many individuals can isolate and safely socially distance and countries where these things are not as possible or not possible for the majority of the population, it's more important than ever to remember the importance of building and maintaining trust both in our own healthcare systems and those of other countries.